Uh, hash from all around the world because I was obsessed with hash when there was so from a young age <laughs> when I got into smoking hash I was <laughs> properly obsessed with it right maybe up to a kilo that I would take across and I'd swallow the hash but the first time I just 25 to life chain to a wall folks <laughs> oh. maybe not the death penalty <laughs> And then I'd, I'd try and do some sort of ratio with the customs and excise. If there was two or three, that would be one in every 50 or one in every 70 people. So you're trying to work out all the time the sort of odds of getting caught, really. Which So there was an insatiability of wanting more all the time. And no matter how much I did, so within it all, there was an emptiness. I'd have quite a bit of heroin on me, because I also got a contact there that I could sell heroin to. And then... On the border from into Malaysia, there's massive signs that says da da means death, drugs means death. Then I just hear a twig break, like a twig break. I look round and there's a soldier uh, with a, a 303 like bolt action rifle and he's got the rifle like that. He's got the rifle, he's standing there like this. So I just, as soon as I see him, I just grab my hash like that. I just fucking grab it like that and I just run. I just... Then that, you know, mm. like you're in a situation you, you could maybe die. You could get 15 years in prison if you were caught. You might not be able to get it out. And I'm delighted because I found a Timex <laughs> watch. <laughs> got, got in now. He's trying to grab my hand, my arms. I'm sort of flailing around in the back. And he's got, he's got the knife at my neck. And it's like, you know, Moroccan prisons are notorious for this as well. I says, I am Scottish. I says, I'm Scottish. I says, but hands, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so... We have got a man of many international adventures with us this evening. He's brought two books. Aye. The Ongoing Path and Nothing to Declare. And I'll read you the back of this one. All the links will be in the description box below the video if you want to check these books out. Mark grew up in a world of secrets, mixed messages about crime, fighting and an alcoholic dad. Mark learned to drink and take drugs before he even kissed a girl. Yet, he went on to achieve his dream of becoming a big-time dealer traveling the world in search of the best product. Ten years later, Mark didn't know how his dream had left him sleeping on a park bench, covered in needle marks and drinking himself to death. This podcast is going to be the story of how he got there and what he did next, because he's doing brilliant work now. He's got a business out of Harley Street with addiction issues, and also you're on the... Um, what was what's the newspaper they sell the big issue? I am on the board. I, I am on the board to the big issue, and yeah, I've done I've done so many different things. So uh, uh, big issue, uh, and um, I used to be on steering groups in the prisons to to minimize. <laughs> it's great. It's quite crazy to minimize drugs. I mean, this is when I used to work for local authorities and stuff like that years ago. So it's a uh, an absolute transformation. Yeah. An absolute transfer from, from 180 degree turn yeah. from a life of complete madness to a life of normality to some degree and uh, and everything's legitimate, you know, as regards. At the peak know. at the peak of the trafficking uh, at the trafficking. <laughs> what? Like, and trafficking, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the peak of the trafficking, what was it life like for you then? Well, it, 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 it right. Okay, there's lots of different parts to this right yeah I, so 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 there's the so right okay so what it felt internally for me mm. was that i had the prestige and the kudos so my ego was inflated massively <laughs> right so i thought internally i'm just a fucking johnny big potatoes really and that i am um, i've got it going on and uh people should all be talking about me and people should you know like so i had this uh, at, at the same time, I had, by that time also, I was had sort of addictions as well. So I was needing to feed these addictions continually. 
right? So I was actually psychologically dependent, moving towards physical dependence on some of the dr drugs. So although I had the money and I had money coming in continually, I also had this raging drug habit as well, which created unmanageability in my life, right? I had crippling fear, right? Because at any point, I thought, whatever money I've got is going to be taken away. I, but more so frightened, really, not necessarily the police, but more so frightened of, because I was in Brixton, a lot of this happened in Brixton, so I was more frightened of yardies that were going to turn me over, people getting to know uh, what, what my business was. And so, so there was a fear that I tried to suppress with more drink and drugs, mm. but was always present, really. There was the ego that was completely inflated, and then there was the habit to the drugs. So, which, so there was an insatiability of wanting more all the time. And no matter how much I did, so within it all, there was an emptiness. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and, and, and also there's this risk taking thing where you're, so it's okay to swear on that. Uh, yeah. yeah, now that we're past the first five minutes of YouTube. Policy di dictates you can say whatever you want. Aye, okay. <laughs> so there's there's also this um, aye, there's a sort of emptiness that comes with it because you can't get enough of the the money doesn't really mean anything after a certain point. So you do it doesn't. It's just figures going into your bank account or whatever you're putting the money that is, and so that doesn't really you know. And also you feel quite a, it, like I felt quite alone within it too because uh, there was fellow obviously fellow drug dealers who were doing the same and people that I would look up to who were who were bigger and um, but uh, yeah it was just like it was just insatiable really alright well bef before we get to your story chronologically then Aye. let's grip everybody with your craziest smuggling or trafficking story okay okay right there's a few um, <laughs> there's a few um <laughs> There was right. Okay, I'll give. Love the way he smiles. I, I, yeah, no, there's a few. I I was once I was once, uh, which I think is quite funny because um, I was quite young at the time. I wasn't at, so I'd started off going to Amsterdam a way back. That was initially where we used to go. We used to go to Amsterdam. We used to buy LSD crystal, LSD, and sometimes hash in, in Amsterdam and bring that back to England. That was quite easy. And then I started to venture out, and we started to go to Morocco. And when I was in Morocco, because at the time, this now, this is 1984, 1985, Morocco, all the hashish that used to come into this country, for a time, well, it was Lebanese and there was Afghani black and all the rest of it, but there was, uh, there was a lot of soap bars that used to come in. They used to call them soap bars, 250 gram blocks. And in the main area where you get them in Morocco is a place called Katama. And uh, so I get to Katama and Katama is like the wild west, right? It's not <laughs> like, it's like if you imagine you could, when you come down from Chef Shouin down to Katama, going on that road, there's people, the Moroccans got on the bus all the time. They've got big, they come in, they get on the bus and they've got bigger lumps of kif, or they call it kif, Moroccans, just hash. And they'll be like, um, uh, chocolate, they call it chocolato. They used to go chocolato, chocolate, and uh, and they're quite aggressive. The Moroccans, as a as a race, are quite aggressive, and also uh, that whole country's corrupt as well. So you've got the police are all corrupt, um, and and so often they'll sell you the hash, and then if you don't know them and they don't think you're going to come back and buy quantity, they'll tell the police and the police it might not even be the police it might just be somebody that's got a badge who looks like the dressed up as police and then they'll take the hash <laughs> want to take the hash off you and then they'll resell the hash but they'll also ask you for money and all that anyway I get to this I get to uh, Katama and uh, I'm in the, now this was one of the first times that I was there so I so I, I'm like fast because I was fat there used to be a book called The Great Books of Hashish uh, that used to have beautiful illustrations, pictures of uh, hash from all around the world. Because I was obsessed with hash. When there was so, from a young age, <laughs> when I got into smoking hash, <laughs> I was <laughs> properly obsessed with it. Right, so it became like this thing. It was like I and and but the thing what the thing that I'm talking about was that 
I want to get as much of it as possible. I want to go to all the countries in this book where it came from, Lebanon, Morocco, Nepal, Afghanistan, uh, you know, so... so I, I, safest I, I, places I, I, in the world. I, I, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I want to, and, and I remember, I've, I've been in these places and I've been in rooms and the fucking rooms full, uh, you know, like just like hundreds of kilos against the wow. wall. And, and I've thought, oh, this is like, how do I get this back to England? How do I... <laughs> This is beautiful. It's like Chris, like Christmas, you know, like fucking. It's like it's such a. I mean, it really is quite yeah. fucked up, isn't it? That your whole that, that, that your whole reality is that this pro, this thing, this material thing, is like brings you so much joy, elation, and yet it's just it's a drug, you know. Like so, so um, so I'm in I'm in Katama, and the guy I I go in. Because so I go into the fields. I go. I, I find. I, I meet this guy, sort of walking around. There's loads of people. When you're on the bus, when you get to the destination, you just get fucking. You just get hassled like chocolate, like all these people just swamp you. And I just sort of like get away from them. So I told them I want to fuck off. And I just and I just started walking away. And then I walked for a wee bit, and there was no one around. And then I seen this guy roaming around. And I thought I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna speak to this guy because he's like no hassle me. So I started speaking to him and he said, I says, where's the, where's the, all the, where's the fields where all the hash is? Where's the, and he says, oh, come with me, come with me, I'll take you, right? So he takes me into the fields. He takes me, meets me, introduces me as our guy. And then the next thing I'm in these fields and it's just all fucking plants, all commercial plants. Wow. But it's like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. And it's just a big, you know, big plants and they're just, you're just right in the middle. And there's a shack, a wee bit like your list, like a little shack in the middle of it all. Where the guys have got their presses and they're pressing up the into, into the soap bars into the thing, um, and and there's just a mountain of grass and they're just anyway. So <laughs> so uh, where I'm there and I'm like I'm thinking this is fucking excellent. There's no place. There's no. I feel quite relaxed. So I buy about half a kilo. I think okay, this is good. I'll head back. I'll go back to Silta. Go back across the border with this half a key. And then I'll come back in a couple of weeks and I'll buy some more and I'll, I'll build it up from there. And uh, and this will be the first bit anyway. So so um, I've I've came out the fields, I've paid them, it's peanuts, it's like £75, £100 a kilo or something back then. It's £2,000 a kilo here or, or a little bit more. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's the markup. It's 2,000%, 2,000%. This is the thing about this <laughs> this business, isn't it? There's a I danger sure, premium, isn't there? Uh, I, there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's a danger premium. But it, it's, yeah, I, I often think, but people with addictions, right, are people mm. who have got addictive, there's that transferable skill thing. I think if we put somebody who's got sort of that addictive, that myopic, focused, obsessive, compulsive element, if you channel that person into something productive, you know, yeah. it could be, I could, I don't know, it could be Bitcoin, it could be anything like, not necessarily Bitcoin, but it could be like something where they're going to take something from A to B and it's got a really good mark. They'll do really well on it. It just happens to be that all the, the lifestyle that I fell into because of family influences was at all illegal. So I, so anyway, I, uh, I, I, I'm coming down, I come down, pay them the money and then I'm walking down the roads. So I've got my little bag uh, and uh, with a hash in it and uh, the, we get to, I get to the, where the bus stop is and it, it, because it's Morocco, because the buses are like uh, f really infrequent, and um, I just thought, all oh, right, I'll start hitching. So I start hitching, and this BMW pulls up. German guys in the car. They've came from Germany. They're there. They're buying a bit of hash somewhere else. So they've got their hash. I've got my hash. I get into the car. They say, are you, where are you going? I say, the border, Ceuta. But I said, listen, I need to stop before because I've got all the cling film I need to wrap up the hash so we need to stop somewhere uh, just before so we're driving along and I see this bit of la like a land I don't really know I just see these like a, a bit of forest and I, I can see this driveway going in I say to them I'll pull in there uh, but I don't notice there's, fen there's sort of fencing around the thing like and um it's ministry. It's like Ministry of Defence land. I don't oh, know. God. So anyway, so I pull in. Right, they pull in. We pull into this field thing, and and there's some woods over here, and I, 
So I'm like uh, with the chairman, so I says, look, I'm, and I pull out my, my link, row of link, I says, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to just wrap this hash up so that it's like, you know, because I'm going to be putting this in my bag and then, you know, and I'm going through this border in case there's any dogs and da da da. And uh, they're saying, oh, yeah, we should do, we've got something, we, we should do the same. So he sends one of the guys, that one of the German guys goes, yeah, I'll come with you and I'll do the same, right? So we're in these woods, these fucking woods, right? <laughs> right we're in these woods and, and I've, got, I've got the hash in front. So I'm on the ground, I've got all these like bits of hash, right? And I'm, I'm starting to wrap up the hash, I've got the cling foam. And then I he and and he's over here. Say his name's Hans for the purpose of this conversation. Can't remember what his name actually was, but but say it's Hans. There was three Germans. So Hans is over here. Um, and then I just hear a twig break, like a twig break. I look round, and there's a soldier uh, where a three o three like bolt action rifle, and he's got the rifle like uh, he's got the rifle. He's standing there like this. So I just as soon as I see him. I just grab my hash like that. I just fucking grab it like that and I just run. I just like <laughs> fucking leg it. And ha and Hans is sort of left, right, because he's nearer oh. the vicinity of the thing. So I run through all these, I run through these woods and then eventually I like, I stop and I think, and I, and I know I'm not getting forward because he's got hands, right? So I'm thinking, right, okay. So I stash my hash. <laughs> I, I, I do a double take, treble take. I keep going back, I go... Like, look, to go back, walk away. Then I keep going back, say, right, remember this bit. Like, remember where I am in comparison. Do that a few times. And then, uh, and, and then I, I, I come out of the clique, I come out of the trees and I can see the car and I can see the soldier and I can see Hans, right? So then I'm like, uh, I'm, looking across, I'm looking across and I can see they're all talking and I can see he's going into the boot of the car and he's, he's getting them to get the rucksacks out. So I go across, I, I go across and, and all the soldier can say really is get limited English and all he can say is problem. It kept on problem, it's a problem. Uh, but he had the hash of, of hands, right? He's got it in his hands and he's asking now for the passports. He's asking, he's got their passports. He's asking now for my passport. And, uh, but he's also went into, he's, he's going into the rucksack of one of the rucksacks and in the rucksack, is all German at the bottom of the rucksack is German porn, right? All the all these German porn mags, right? That they've got the boys have got. So he he he, he, likes, he picks up the German porn and he starts flicking through the pages of the German <laughs> porn, right? And I'm I'm looking, I'm thinking, what the fuck's he doing that? You know, like, because I'm thinking, I just want to, we just need to get this guy out there. You know, like, so I'm thinking we just need to hit him around the head with a bit of wood or something just to get, <laughs> just to get him knocked out. The borders, the borders only 30 mile away. We can just smash him with a fucking a rock or something. And then just, and then, so, so then he's like, he goes to me in hands. He says, um, he's like, points at us and he goes, come back as it motioning back to the woods right so i'm like uh so so i'm thinking uh what the fuck right so i i so i'm thinking right okay i can't do it because he's got this he's got the rifle he's got also my passports also the other german boys are not really making any like movements as if they want to hit him with a bit of wood around the head either so i think they're 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 like being really like in freeze moment right like they're just like not aggressive at all, whereas I'm more like, I've got to fight and get out of this situation. So <clears throat> we go back into the woods and we're, we go, we're moving back into the woods and, and, and as we're going along, more or less to the same place as we were before, there's a tree, there's a, um, there's a tree there and there's a branch that comes out from the tree, like sort of horizontal across like that. And he motions towards me, he motions to me and the branch, right? And he, most, he does this hand signal like, as in, you bend over the branch, right? At the same time as he's doing this, he starts to loosen his trouser, right? What? <laughs> I'm serious, man, right? He starts to loosen his And what? so, I, this is true, I watch well, Morocco, isn't it? And I mean, it's not, no, no offence to him, it's Morocco, but it's, it's Morocco back then, and and, uh, <laughs> and and it's like you know Moroccan prisons are notorious for this as well. So I I am. Um, so the first thing before I can even say anything, I said, 
I says, I says, no, 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 no. I says, I says, I am Scottish. I says, I'm Scottish. I says, but Hans, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I says, Hans, no. So then, <laughs> so then Hans is looking at me. The soldier's looking at me confused. And I don't know. I mean, the Scottish thing, it's a completely, obviously, completely irrelevant. What nationality you have? Somebody's like, fuck you up with a bum. It doesn't really matter if you're Scottish, English, or Jamaican. It doesn't really, it's always the same thing. But, but he, and then, and then I spend a while because I'm in the sort of fear and adrenalization of it, really. I sort of, then I'm convincing Hans. I'm saying, Hans, eh, uh, listen. I'm Scottish. There's no way I can do it, and I'm really, really like quite serious about it as well. I'm Scottish. There's no way I can do it, but I won't see anything. You can go back. You, you can. Like, I'll just come out of the bushes. You do the business. Right? You take one for the troops, really, and then I will. I'll never mention it. MD and Hans is like looking at me, and and uh, he sort of, you know, he's like he's not going to do it really, and then eventually I. I sort of, I'm trying to coerce because I'm because the soldiers still like want the victim really, and I and there's only it's like I'm not doing it. Hans is not doing it, so he's like I'm thinking let's get him back out the bushes. So then I we go back out the bushes, uh, or back out this these woods, and we get back to the car, and then I spend the next twenty minutes with the rest of the Germans saying to them, look, this is the story, guys, right? One of yous. One of you needs to take it right up the arse. It's your pornography, right? I wouldn't be in this situation if it wasn't for your pornography and for hands getting caught in the first place. So really, you know what I mean? One of you should do it. I mean, the other option is, because I know he can't speak really English, is we smash him around the head with a rock and we just head for the border. And they're like, <laughs> and, and they're like, they're looking at me still, like, because they're just not really in the same thinking at all. And so eventually what happens is uh, I had like a so it was Sony Walkmans and all that back then. I gave them a Sony Walkman. They gave them the porn. They had a Walkman between them. We gave them the Walkman. We gave them some money. And 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 then and then we still had to, and then he still didn't uh, give us the passports back. And then he said, look, I want to go to the town, right? So... What? We're all in, I know, yeah. So then we're all in the car with this fucking soldier, right? Who still got Hans's hash, <sighs> right? Because they're not wanted like be violent in any way or, or or just. So I'm I'm sitting there and I'm saying to them because I'm raging at the time. I'm saying, look, when we get to the town because we park at the police station and we're outside the police station and even then he starts to get out the car and he still got our passports and I I was like. And then he he just, he got out of the car and then he started to walk away. I think he was just trying to really wind us up. And then he just came back to the window and he put the, he put the passports through the window. Wow. But he kept the hash. He kept the hash. Yeah. And, uh, and then I, I, I was like, okay, guys, right, you need to take me back. You need to take me back to them woods. We need to go back so that I can get my hash. Yeah. You know, and that was, so it was quite a mad... That was what I know, I've had other ones, but so you got the hash and then got, I got the hash the border, and then okay. and got back. Yeah, yeah. No, How did you get it across the border? I just had it in my bag and it was like really easy and I had it like all wrapped. I wrapped it up in the cling film and it was just and there was no. It wasn't like a false bottom bag. It was just a pure camera It was just yeah, yeah, just at the bottom. Holy shit, Mark! These are absolutely brilliant. Let's keep going. What's the next one? <laughs> Right, okay, okay, one, um, let me try, uh, right, ones that are funny, man, right, okay, I'll tell you a funny one, uh, I was going from, one time I was going from, uh, so I, I used to go to India, I used to go from India to Thailand with hash as well, because you don't get hash in Thailand, it's grass, it's all grass, well, you can get hash, but it's expensive, and so this is a death penalty situation. Yeah, and 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 I in Thailand, yeah, yeah, it is. I think for over a set. I mean, I don't know. Like, I was only it was only like half a kilo, or maybe up to a kilo that I would take across, and I'd swallow the hash. But the first time That's I just twenty five to life chain to a wall, folks. Oh. <laughs> maybe not the death penalty. <laughs> I know. See, see, this is the thing, Sean. See, when you're in this thing, you don't really consider when you're in addiction. This is the thing about 
now I'm in recovery a long time. I'm 24 year clean, you know, and, and sober. I've no thing. But when I think about the way the cognitive impairment that happens as a result of having an addictive personality, lots of this stuff I wouldn't think, I wouldn't think twice. And a, a lot of it's about also, if I look at the underlying thing, is like the adrenalization that I used to get, the, 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 <clears throat> the buzz, the excitement that comes with it. And it like gambling because there's always, I mean, I remember when I used to go on planes, I used to count if I'd be carrying it in a suitcase or something through back into Heathrow or Gatwick or whatever it'd be, I would count how many people were on the plane. I'd count how many people were on the plane. And then I'd, I'd try and do some sort of ratio with the customs and excise. If there was two or three, that would be one in every 50 or one in every 70 people. So you're trying to work out all the time the sort of odds of getting caught, really. But there's this adrenalization that comes with it, this high that comes when you get through the other side. and But then also there's a low that comes with it because because I always used to think, i never done enough. I should have had more in my bag or I should have done more. So at this time, this time I I had sussed out there's there's these um there was a lot of immigration scams that used to happen the way back in Thailand helping uh, Tamil tigers get in from <clears throat> so Sri Lankans really who were terrorist Tamil tigers who wanted to get to Europe and I knew a guy in Bangkok who would you'd you, you there was a system where you would can't, you would help them get to Europe by booking a ticket under your name and they would use that ticket and things. So I knew that when I'm in Thailand, the flight back was all paid for and I'd make a chunk of money from doing this, This just just basically taking somebody's luggage, you give them their luggage, you tell them your seat number, you book the ticket, you give them, you leave the ticket in the... T anyway, so there was this whole this system. So I'm going, to, I'm going to Thailand, but this time I've got a heroin habit, right? So I've got heroin hope makes you constipate, you know, it makes you... Uh, when you've when you take and you, especially when you're injecting heroin, uh, if you're shooting up heroin, you get constipated, and when you're taking the heroin, but once you're coming off it, you've got diarrhea and you've got like so. Okay, so I fly in, I've ate about about five hundred grams or something. It was around about that time, maybe about four hundred fifty grams, and I've somebody it says because no, there's no. Um, there's no, I mean, all this smuggling stuff that you hear, is, there's no book out there how to smuggle drugs. Mm -hmm. So there's no, it's just word of mouth, really. People's telling you how they done it and things. So these, <clears throat> so I'd heard that I should dip when I do the caramellos, when I'm, before I swallow them, because it was all swallowed, uh, which takes ages, of course, because you've got to just keep on dropping. I would then, somebody says, dip it in beeswax, right? So dip it in this beeswax, so it puts a coating round and also the same person, I think, who told me that, said to me also that each layer of cling film lasts, the body acids go through one layer of cling film every 24 hours. So um, so I wrapped it in three layers of cling film. I dipped it in the beeswax and I thought that probably gets another day out of the beeswax. So I swallowed it all. I've got a heroin habit, right? So I'm constipated. I get to Bangkok. I go to, I'm on Kosan Road, I go to the snooker hall, I score some heroin, right? Instead of like just going straight to the chemist and buying laxatives and and then starting to go into a wee bit of cold turkey so that I can get this stuff out, my head says to me at the time, oh well it's okay, Mark, because this is this is the this is what I suffer from. I have an addict voice that says to me that it's like a twin that resides inside. So the twin said, um, uh, it's okay. You've got you've got uh, three layers of cling film on this. You've got the beeswax on it. So you've got four days really before you need to really get it out before it's going to start. And <clears throat> so, so I go and get the heroin. I shoot up the heroin. Uh, take a drink. Eat some food. Uh, whatever that night. Next day, I think oh, I've still got a couple of days. Uh, I've still got a couple of days. Grace. Really, and then and then and also what starts to happen, which is a bit of a mad one, is my head says, "What's well, only ha what's the worst that can happen? Even if it because it's only harsh, it's not like heroin or coke, where if it starts to rupture, you're totally dead. 
you're just going to get incredibly stoned. <laughs> 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 and, you know, so anyway, by the third day, I have this, I have this experience where I'm having this experience where uh, I'm, I'm con I've been constipated, but, but also I'm dying for a shit, right? But the, because of the beeswax, the whole thing is congealed, really, is, is, is sort of, it's sort of forged together, morphed to get into this sort of lump. So, right, so it's like two o'clock in the morning. I'm in one of these toilets in Thailand, in, adjacent to my room. So I've got this ensuite toilet in my room. And I've, <clears throat> um, and uh, I don't even know if it was in my room, if it was outside, because actually, right, because there's a story about that. Cause, so anyway, I'm in this, <clears throat> I'm in this toilet and I go into the toilet and I, I'm like, I need to get this out, but I'm trying to push and I cannot, I cannot get it out of me. Now you can obviously go to the hospital and say, oh, by the way, I've got this massive bit of hash in my stomach, you know, uh, I need to, you know. So I have this idea because they have all hoses, don't they? have got all the hoses for cleaning your bum and the thing. So I have this idea at the time, I know what I'll do. I'll shove this hose. <laughs> you know what's happening here, don't you? <laughs> so here I am, grace hose that comes, isn't it? With a Taiwanese hose shoved up my arse, like <laughs> full pressure. I'm trying to break down. Because this was the thinking, yeah. if I sh the pressure's on, then it'll just like, and it'll just break it all down <laughs> and clean it, and it'll just all like trickle down. Yeah. And what's mad yeah. about it, in the, in the process, right, I looked across, and on the floor, this is why it was, wasn't in the room, it was, there was a, a watch on the floor, right, a Timex watch. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I looked across and I thought, what a result, man. There's somebody's left a watch. Right? I've just found a watch. I put the watch in my pocket and I thought, oh, it's Christmas. Like, almost like I've got this. And I often think, I think, you know, you're in absolute pain, misery. It doesn't really get much worse than that. You know, like you're in a situation you, you could maybe die. You could get 15 years in prison if you were caught. You might not be able to get it out. And I'm delighted because I found a Timex watch. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know? What I mean? so, so anyway, I, I um, and and um, um. and and and, I, I, and it worked. It did work. It broke down. <laughs> it broke down. It, the pressure. Don't know if it was pressure, and it just went boom, 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 and then it was out. And I was like, and I had to watch, and I was like, went on my way away. Where did the product go from there? The product went to um, a guy who ran a hotel and, or, or he, he worked in a hotel in Sukhumvit in Bangkok and he would buy it all straight off and then he would sell it to tourists in Bangkok. And then, and then what happened in my relationship, I never done the beeswax ever again after I just came and I'd just done the thing that was okay. But um, so, uh, and then I just went down to the island and then I'd, the island's coping gang and then I would hang out there for a wee bit and then I'd come back and I'd do it again. But that was near the end. That was this type of drug smuggling and this was the the desk sort of more the not the not the the Moroccan one was more at the start and that was it sort of beginning just sort of experiencing and seeing what potentially could be done in Morocco or on the south of Spain. The which progressed, that progressed, uh, and then I wound up in prison in Spain in the 87. Uh, but th these ones were nearer the end when I'd wound up with addiction, real addiction, more addiction problems. And I was just like l doing it to survive and to get more money and to, to, to keep the habit going, really. What was Spanish prison like? Oh, it was a mad, it was mad. So it was 1987 Spanish prison. Uh, Alarin, it's, it's called Alarin uh, del Toro in, in Malaga and uh, so we were buying crystal LSD, so how it all came about was we were buying crystal LSD in Holland uh, for 5 grams of crystal uh, it was 10,400 I remember all, a lot of the figures it's funny with this stuff, isn't it how <laughs> years and years later, we were buying the crystal and out the crystal we'd then we'd dilute it, put the mass on that 
gloves, eye drops, and we'd make 70 or 80,000 trips at a time. So I was taking the trips down to the south of Spain and spot, swapping it for hash and then bringing the hash back to England. Ah. And it was a good... And at that time, the Brinks Mac, so the, some of the Brinks Mac guys had all, all... Well, quite a lot of the old bank robbers here started to go down that way because they were avoiding... Because they were going to get nicked. And, and also, they get involved in the hash trade because, because there was far more money and from that crossing from Morocco across, they were doing tons every night. They were doing tons of hash speedboats. So a lot of the London there was a lot of London lads in that Spanish prison. A lot of who used to ring cars. He, they were involved in ringing cars. They would they would they would get Porsches from here or BMs and they would take them down to South Spain. They'd, so they would ring. But they they became runners for some of the bank robbers who were based out of Porto Benus in Marbella. Uh, Fuengarola. So I knew some of, I knew, I had connections with some of them guys. Uh, well, one one guy in particular. And then, uh, so I, I wound up, uh, the, 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 how I actually got arrested was was quite, because the things that I've, I should have been arrested for, I've never been arrested for. The things that were quite stupid things that I shouldn't have really been that, it shouldn't really have happened, but did happen. So with with that situation, uh, we were in a bar. We were in a bar uh, in Fuengarola, and uh, and I took a couple of traveller friends. I mean, it's quite hard to like convoy Stonehenge from the Stonehenge days. They were like lived on the road all the time, a bit like Snatch, you know, like Brad Pitt and Snatch. There was one character in particular. I'm not really mention his name because he's still alive and he's he's a friend of mine. You know, so, but he was like he loved a fight and he loved a good box and he could box. He was really good at fighting as well. So I took him and I took this other guy and we get down there and I've got all this acid and I'm going to do this business. I take them for a holiday. I think I'm going to, I'm doing a bit of a spiritual generous thing here. I'm going to take them on holiday. I've got these credit cards that are from this burglary that uh, they've not been used. I'll buy them some clothes. I'll, I'll take them out. So we go to this bar called The Cave Bar in Fingerola, and we're having a, and basically we're having a drink and the clash are on the big screen and there's a clash and there are bottles. And what kept on happening is every time, every time we're dancing, we're out our head, we're dancing. And the next thing, every time we looked around, we got another group of bottles of San Miguel. They kept going missing. So my friend who likes a fight says, listen, these fuckers are keep on stealing our thing. They give us some of them acids and I'll, I'll, I'm going to go, so, so I says, how many? He says, well, give us 50. It doesn't take, it take, I gave him quite a few, but he put like two or three in. So he got like six bottles of San Miguel and he bumped two or three trips in each one of them. They were really strong acids as well. Um, white lightnings. And then, um, so he flings them in. <laughs> And these th these two guys who have been stealing the beers, right? And the, their sister, who's like sixteen years or seventeen years old, she gets one as well. So they're all fucking. They start to realise what's going on, and then they're they're like daggers across at us, right? <laughs> but they're the ones stealing our fucking beer. You know what I mean? Take responsibility <laughs> for the thing, like so so. So the next thing, the next thing, they're like daggers. And uh, we're just like, I'm just sort of oblivious to it all, really, to some degree. But I know that I've gave him the asses. I know he's done something with them because I know what he's like. And then I just remember him going like that and the big anarchy sign in his hand. He just went like that. He wants some of that to, to, the, to, to, to the guys. And uh, the next thing, he's walking out and they're following him out the door of this bar. So I, I I come I come running I come running out and they're like on the floor and they're bashing the shit out of them. And uh, so I jump in to 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 save them really and then I'm getting smashed around as well. But meanwhile, my friend who who's also a taken, right? Who's dead now. Uh, lots of the people I used to hang out are, de are dead of addiction, you know, or they, they were killed or they died from addiction or they have done big prison sentences. Or, but anyway, um, so he he takes the boy, the boys who were fighting me. He takes the leather jackets. He just goes and picks up because they've left their they've taken their jackets off, and he goes. So he takes the leather jackets and goes and puts the jacket somewhere. 
So when next thing the police get caught, the police get called because I think they realise the leather jackets are gone. The police come, we get put in the car. It's uh, and it's the Guardia Civil. I don't know if you know the Guardia Civil were heavy men. They were, and were heavy back then. So this is eighty seven, eighty eight, and they they bundles in, but they bundle me into a car with my two friends. My other friend gets bundled into a car on his own, and as soon as I get in the car. Uh, I've got about 400 trips on me. I've got loads of, I've got thousands of trips in my rucksack in this bar. Thank God I'd left them there. Uh, <clears throat> and they, uh, basically what I'd done, as soon as I got in the car, because there's three of us, I just took the acid out and I just slid it down the back of the car seat. But then I had these gold MasterCard and a Visa card and I couldn't, I went to try and take them out and the police went, capacity, looked around and went and I thought, okay, I'm going to have to just leave these here. Uh, and if I try and put them there and then they find the asset, right, so just just take the hit on the credit cards. And <clears throat> and uh, we get to the station, uh, we, get, we get kept for a week in this holding cell in Fuengarola. Uh, my friend, the one who I gave the acid to, still had some acid, and they never found his acid. So in that week when we were in the police, this station, this thing, he was eating acid <laughs> every day. He was just like a mad, sort of my character. They just used to take, just used to eat acid when he was like in a cell, like the worst place <laughs> you could possibly ever take LSD. But uh, <clears throat> and then eventually we wound up. Uh, going to court and then in court uh, we could, weren't allowed to go into the court we, the translator went in came back out and he said look uh, you took the two guys that started to fight really you can go he said to me you've got a 500 pound fine I was like oh result right okay so I so the gold master card and the visa card because they hadn't been used in Spain yet and uh, but your friend the other friend who was in his car on his own he was going to get, he was, uh, he had £500. They said, oh, he's got £500 bail. So I had £500 in my thing. So I said, oh, listen, that's cool. I'll pay for his bail and let's get it done. And uh, so they went back in, came back out and says, no, actually, what's going to happen is they're going to keep the £500 and they're going to, you and him are going to Alarin. So then I wound up in this Spanish prison and for almost six months, I was in on without uh, on remand, really. Um, and then I'd go to the British Embassy. Now the prison itself was like uh, a cat. It was like it. It was like you know, like here we've got cat A, B, C. So it's like it. It was like a mixture of all different people. So it was a dormitories as well. So each each. Um, that prison in particular had like 12 dormitories. The 12th dormitory was like a mixture of English and Scottish and some French. There was a, some really interesting characters in that thing, but it was mostly all sort of European. All the other dormitories were all Spanish, mostly all Spanish. And and so you'd have in the dormitory, in my dormitory, I get put in dormitory too with my friend, it was, there was only one other English guy there who was like a big time, he was like DiCaprio from the, you know, Catch Me If You Can, mm. he was like an English guy who was involved, very posh chap who had got caught for massive fraud in lots of different countries. And when I came into the dormitory, I remember him, he was like, oh, thank God, it's good to see you, because he'd been there, and I think he'd just been really bullied, like really, probably, maybe, I don't know what had happened to him, but he was des he was like, Delighted to see us, and and what this what the dormitory was like is you had it created its own divisions where you had all the petty criminals on one side, so you had like all your shoplifters and burglars and stuff like that, or you know like the the, the lower end, the petty criminals at one end, and at the other end of the dormitory, and it was like a sliding scale. It was like a fucking sliding scale. They had created almost as if they said, what are you arrested for? Well, okay, well, we think that should be, you should be on that bed there because you're, you're you know, it was like that, but it was created so that you had real, you had these characters who were like eta separatists. So they were proper terrorists, right? Who were bringing in tons of hash, lots of guns, murders galore, all that. They were at this side. And then you had all these fucking 
and actually, I, I had no problem with these bigger guys. They were, they were the fucking, they were really nice. They were, I mean, not really nice. Nice is not the word. <laughs> operative word here. They're not really nice because, because, but they are. But the guys that I had the most hassle with was all these plebs who were like trying to sort of fight their way to the top and try to prove themselves. And um, so, so I get in there, and then it was just the usual like this pleb saying give me your shirt and it was like you know and right away i know if i give him the shirt that's it it's all over <sighs> so i can't give him the shirt and and then i've got i've got him going give me the shirt you know marikita you know it's in spanish derogatory give me this shirt marikita or americana or whatever it was he was used to say and then uh, i was like no you're gonna have to come and get it you're gonna have to but then at the same time i've got i'm petrified really because i've got i've got I'm I'm there and there's just I don't know you know what's going to happen really and there's uh, guys behind them going fucking hit just hit him like this and uh, and you don't know if you're just getting set up but for me it was lucky I did, you know it never came any blows he just as soon as I went like you're not getting it and he could see clearly there was no way it was happening but then he was like I'm going to start you know because they had they used to make these knives where they would make these they were like they were like these. <laughs> They were like wooden handles and they, it was like a long pin and they used to sharpen the top and it just go through your rib, go through your rib oh. cage, really. Yeah, so they used to have them. So he would be like, I'm going to fuck you up. I'm going to fuck you up. And I'd be like, okay. So for a couple of nights, two or three nights, I just was like waiting for this this guy to, stick, to plunge me really in the middle of the night. Sleep, or you sleep? Like, no, I just was like totally like, because I just couldn't because my brain was just like, and then I just got so tired and I was like, look, if it's going to happen, it's going to, like, because I can't keep, you know, um, and it never happened and it was all right. And and it was, it was a mat in that dormitory I witnessed, oh, my, because, because what it was like you, you had in the dormitory system, it creates, you've got, it, it's like because they're, everybody's in together and they smoke a lot of hash. Spanish prison as well, uh, they, at that time, it was mad because um, they used to get, so you get uh, intimate, like, uh, conjugal visits. You used to get conjugal, mm. you used to get prostitutes, so you used to get girlfriends to come in every month. They give you a cell for two hours. So you could get, like, these sort of privileges. You, uh, every day, this is what I remember really, right? And imagine, right, all the lads, right, that were Scottish, English, there was a couple of kidnappers that I became friends with, where these three guys who were kidnapped, I mean, it was Scottish, Irish, and English, actually, it was like a, it was like a joke, really, <laughs> who had kidnapped this really uh, affluent, they were in dormitory 12, there was a whole group of guys, and what used to happen every day in the courtyard, you used to get out for four hours a day as well, which was quite good, and it was sunny, it was sunny, I mean, I'm not, it's <laughs> like, the only way I'm describing it is as if it's like a holiday, but, but in a way, it was quite funny, because, it felt like a bapt for me, it felt, because I'd never been in prison before. I'd been arrested when I was younger. My dad had managed to get me a really good lawyer in Glasgow and got me got me thing. But but um, the, this, we used to sit and we used to, uh, people would be, would be smoking spliffs and people would be like saying, all right, okay, this is what happened to me. This is how I got caught. And then they would say, okay, I had 750 kilo. I was on the boat. I never checked the weather forecast. We hit a storm. Or, you know, this happened, this happened, we lost the thing. And and people would talk about their, like, their various stories. And a lot of the guys who were in there were getting really looked after by the guys that were still on the out, right? Because, which is quite interesting, there was a, like, a sense of loyalty that, that was going on within, within it. It appeared to me as if, you know, because they were like, they'd been working for these guys for, for, for a couple of years people get greedy isn't it they like they were they were doing speedboats all the time and and if you imagine the demand here in the UK they were putting it all into furniture it was all coming back into the UK and furniture a lot of it all coming up going to uh, Santander it was mostly like coming on ferries and all that going to cross back to Portsmouth or Plymouth from Santander or Bilbao and so it was all, all the hash was sort of coming back and these guys were getting seven year, five year, seven year, ten, maybe at the most ten year sentences. 
but they'd also been doing it a while, so they'd tucked away quite a few quid as well. You know, some of them hadn't. They'd, it was their second or third run, and they just happened to be on mm. court. Unfortunate for them, really. But some of them had done all right, and they had like money stashed away in different bank accounts, false names, and everything else. So, so it was a, it was quite a, a fun experience. And and in the actual dormitory, um, like just it would, everybody was smoking hash at night. So every because what would happen during the day, right? They used to play tennis, like Sean. They used to play tennis against the wall. I, I never can, I could never work out why the screws really never, because. The, there was a turret thing. It was like something like, like Colditz or something like that, Sharp, Sharp, Sharp Redemption or something. There was a big turret like in the middle <laughs> where there'd be the, the screws in there. And then people would play tennis against the wall, right? So they'd be actually doing, like, with the rackets, playing against. And then, of course, a ball would come flying over the wall, right? And then they would there would be this thing where everything would stop now and... You'd see one guy, so you'd see the screws all running down because they've clocked this ball coming over the wall, which is full of like benzos, like sleeping tablets or whatever it is, or maybe heroin for all I know. And then uh, it would just get thrown around from one person to another. People used to make lots of hooch. So every day, because it's hot, right? So they would, they would with their spends, their money, they would, they would get these buckets. They would put all the fruit in the buckets. They'd put sugar or loads of sugar and they would, they would, so there was all these old guys who'd been in there for years with these fucking buckets that they would take out every day into the courtyard and they'd put like cloth, they'd put these like, so a big bucket like just full of alcohol that are going to ferment and they'd put a cloth over the top and then they'd take the cloth off and they'd let it ferment in the, the sun and, and it was, so it was quite a mad, a mad experience. <laughs> And uh, and and I, I remember that like, I came out of there and I thought, oh, I I'd got lots of contacts. I I got out and I I thought, right, okay, I've got these contacts. I can come back and I can you know and do more whatever whatever it looks like. So yeah, that was that really. Holy shit, man! These are gripping. Wow. Did you get in a situation got with Golden Triangle heroin crossing the Malaysian border? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, well. I think what uh, why I've said that one really is because my my heroin addiction became so intense. Look, what what started to happen was as my heroin habit got uh, bigger, and I thought I'll, when I was in Thailand, I thought, well, I may as well. I met these addicts who were like, "This is look, why you if you're going to like go right into." Go right up to near the Shan area, which is on the board, like Burma, really, where there used to be a warlord there called Kung Sa, uh, and he had an army, a Rangoon. In fact, American gangster Denzel Washington, who plays, he he, the real guy is called Frank Lucas. In the in the in the movie, when Denzel Washington, an American gangster, he, there's a part where you see him going into the Thai. You see him going in, he goes up this stream with his brother-in-law or whatever, and they wind up in this, they wind up in this farm where there's loads and loads of heroin. And he's sitting down with this Thai, Thai guy, warlord, right? And the warlord says to him, says to Denzel, says, how are you going to get the heroin? Blue Magic. The heroin was called Blue Magic. That was his brand, right? Then Frank looks at his black brand that he flooded New York with in the late 60s. They used to bring it in corpses in the, with the Vietnam veterans. Anyway, so he says to him, uh, how are you going to get it? Who do you work for? Who's your, who's your like, he says, he says, uh, don't you, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, he said, and then, and then the guy goes, okay, the, the warlord, which is this Kung Sa, uh, he says, yeah, okay, I'll give you as much heroin as you want. And and then he goes, yeah, my man, my man. And then he, that's it. And that's just the, that's the, that's the true story of what happened with Frank Lucas. So this I knew about this area, like not from that movie because that movie hadn't come out at that time. But I knew about that of all the areas that, and these ad, these other addicts had told me about. If you go right into the sort of hill tribes, then it's really cheap. And didn't, didn't David McMillan talk about Kunsa? Can't remember. Yeah. Yeah, who's the... All oh, right, okay. We're a guy on called David Macmillan. Um, 
and he was trafficking heroin and he's got stories of um the golden triangle in thailand and stuff I, around the same time i think was you. it i i yeah, I. yeah so i got i got right into the so i went up there and um and I wound up in these little villages and it was just like hill tribes, really. And um, the heroin was really cheap. And then, uh, and I wound up getting a real habit on it. You know, it's mm. like, it's pure, it's really pure. But it's like, whereas this, that heroin here would have cost, oh God, you could cut it, left it, because it was so pure. You You just put cold water there's no, there's no impurities whatsoever. And to some degree, I mean, which is like what's screwed up about the, a lot of the heroin, a lot of the brown sugar that started to come in here from Iran and all that th after the Ayatollah got, uh, came into power and, um, and the Shah got deposed was that a, a lot of that brown heroin is so many adulterants. So it was only like mm. maybe 30, 40% pure. The rest of it's all just cut with all sorts of stuff really. Mm. Whereas that white heroin, they called it number four, was the purest. So really, when you got an addiction to that, it was an. Uh, although you, you certainly got an addiction because because of the endorphin, because basically how heroin works on your endorphin system, and the cold turkey, you you certainly are really really sick if you're trying to come off it. You don't have a lot of the adulterants in it that you don't have. It doesn't damage the body. So when you're taking it every day, it's not causing the same damage mm. than a lot of the street heroin would. And uh, so I wound up there and then and then I wound up having to go to because I have to because Thailand, I had to keep coming out of Thailand. So I had to cross the border into Malaysia. And then when I crossed the border into Malaysia to get my visas, I'd have to take heroin with me because I'd be sick. And th and then I'd be on the on the way on the border, on the border from into Malaysia, there's massive signs that says da da means death, drugs means death. So when I was going through the borders, I'd have quite a bit of heroin on me because I also got a contact there that I could sell heroin to. And then, but, and I remember, and it's mad really because I, because I often think about this, I think when I took heroin internally inside me, right? It just takes one one of them balloons, just any seepage. Now, when I was wrapping the balloons a lot of times, I used to even get people to help me do the balloons. So I didn't even, I was like, so I was out my head doing it as well. And I'd say, look, I'll give you a turn on, I'll give you some heroin, wrap some of these. So we'd wrap it in cling foam. I used to use, actually, <clears throat> not the condoms, Indian condoms. I'd use balloon, actual balloons, and then I'd wrap. But one of them starts to seep. It's all over. It really is all over. So, so if it doesn't kill you by going off inside you, if you get caught, if you've got it external to the body and you get caught with it, you know. Now back then, a lot of times you didn't have all these machines that you go in where you scan the body. I mean, they came in later on. But in places like that, where it's really little border, small border patrols, border crossings, they're not so sophisticated. It's a third world country. They didn't really have the, the advanced technology. So, but I remember sniffing heroin on the back of this bus, like, and looking up at the sign, Dada means death, drugs means death, right? And then just taking an odd, taking a thing. And there's people on the bus, just like Malaysian people or Thai people, just like all chatting away. And if any of them had just looked around at that moment and just seen me, they could easily have just went, that guy, and when I got to the border. So often I think, how? How did I manage? What What was it work? How did I get through all of those? And I'm talking a lot of them types of experiences. How the the I mean even if you're shooting up heroin every day and you're shoot, shoot, shooting up really strong heroin, at some point you're going to overdose, isn't you? But I I managed to, and the and the situations that I've been in where and the, and just the people also been in situations where people where I've been stabbed, I've had guns at my head, I've had the whole like you know and yet uh, you know found ways to navigate. And also found ways to navigate people who are psychopaths, right? 
there's something there's something about something about Glasgow per fucking square inch. There's more psychopaths per square inch in Glasgow than in any city in the world, right? <laughs> I think. And and I think from a young age, I learned how to, I think it was some of my family members, I learned how to, how to, because I wasn't, I, I mean, I, I'm a psychopath as well, but I'm not a violent, I'm not a really, a, I'm not an aggressive violent, but I mean, I, I can fight and I can do it, I could, I fought a lot when I was younger, but I'm not, I don't go out my way, I'm not, I'm not aggressive by nature, but I've always been around a lot of aggressive people, <laughs> you know, are violent people. And there is something about this, there's something about that as well, that almost like, oh, I know how to deal with this situation. I know how to, like, navigate my way around it, you know, and it's it's familiar. There's a familiarity with it. <laughs> Why did you get stabbed? Uh, oh, that was, in, uh, that was in Brixton, and that was just a fight. That was just a... That that was basically that. So that wasn't there. That was uh, a guy said something to I. But a guy said something to my girlfriend at the time, and I punched him. Do you remember what he said? Uh, he said something like, "You and your you and your bird going." Uh, he, he just said something. I can't even remember what what it particularly was, but it was something that I felt that he's disrespecting this girlfriend of mine. And I don't think she particularly cared, but my ego, my ego <laughs> felt obliged to, because I thought if I don't say something, if I don't go and punch him, then, you know, she'll think less of me. He'll certainly do it again. So let's go and punch him. He was a, he was a psychopath. And I just went up, punched him, uh, got into a bit of a tussle with him. He fought back. I, I seemed to be on top of things. Uh, got split up. I went on my merry way. Later on in the afternoon, I'm walking along in Brixton, and uh, I've got this white shirt on. Uh, I, and the next thing, I I don't even see him. He just comes from sort of nowhere and literally just comes straight up and just goes. Chuk, chuk. But it wasn't like a. It was a Stanley, one of them Stanley, Stanley. long. You know the long thing. It was one of them. So it wasn't like a like a proper knife but it was fuck it it was it still was <laughs> my whole shirt just went full of blood and I went ah like because I thought because I didn't really it was so quick and I never even really felt it because I was sort of quite numb because I've been drinking and using so that was that um the, the gun thing is just I was around people way back in the 80s they had they had a lot of guns they were involved with I, they were I and LA guys they were involved in Di and LA were really uh, doing lots of incendiary devices in London, 1985, 1986. They were bringing loads of hash. They were making loads of speed at the time. And they were psychopaths as well. And <laughs> well, one in particular was a real psychopath. But, we, and, but I, 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 he was a friend as well. And I used to go out and so, <laughs> so, so I'd go out and have drinks. This is the thing about this whole thing that, that, it became like, you know, I, throughout the whole thing, I was aware that these people are so volatile. And, but yet at the same time, it was like all part of the terrain. It's like, this is, this is just the way it is. This is the way it is. And you, you have to just make the most of it really. And to get to, to, to survive really. What was the situation whereby your friend Ian died? Uh, that was like my 25th birthday party and so on my 25th birthday party it was like um, I had lots of like drug dealers who were there because it was a it was like it was like actually a drug dealers convention because <laughs> <laughs> you just get to know all these other drug dealers mm. who are doing more or less the same thing so I invited all them there was a guy, there was a South African guy called Tok. I can see it, I think I can see it now. He's dead anyway, so it's like it's not gonna make any difference. But um and Tokes uh was like a sort of heroin dealer. I was I invited some of the I the some of the guys that were sort of I and LA guys who were providing loads of drugs for us to sell, like containers of 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 hash that were coming into the South England. And um, 
and they were really they were like they were like uh, very protective towards my friend uh, his name, Ian and what happened was uh, Ian uh, the, this guy talks he wanted some heroin from talks and Ian wasn't a, a, an addict a heroin addict it was more like a speed addict really so he had no tolerance to heroin he took some heroin he overdosed I found his body uh, the next day he had a fixie, so he choked on his vomit. Mm. I came downstairs to his room. His dog was there. It's like his dog was sitting. He's a, a, a salvation dog. The dog was there. Uh, he had he had like started to overdose. The people had brought him round, but they'd laid him on his back, and like instead of laying him on his side, because no, like just, and then he'd laid him on his back. He basically. Uh, then choked, mm. and then he choked on his vomit. So when I found him, he was de he he's I don't know how many hours he'd been dead, but he was only twenty four years old. He was like my best friend at the time. But this I'll tell you this, Sean. This is what shows you the depths that you get into with addic the addiction. And I'm not blaming. Look, I mean a lot of the decisions I made. I made these decisions. It's not all like oh yeah, I I can play. But at the time when I found his body the house was full of drug like full i had like the the i and la people so i wasn't i never really sold much ecstasy they had load they gave him a big bag of ecstasy to take to glastonbury to sell he'd lunched out a bit and was giving people fucking ecstasy for free and you know and not never really and then but i had like loads of hash i had loads of speed i had loads of lsd i phoned up at the time, I phoned up this guy from Brixton that I knew who had a flat down in Brixton. I says, look, come up, bring a bag, a big bag with you and take all these drugs for me. I'll sort you out, you know, take it to your house. Uh, I need to clean out. I need to wipe down the, all the fucking fingerprints off all the door. I need to like clean as if I've never been there. Because uh, I was like, uh, uh, and then, and then, basically uh, the guy who gave him the heroin I phoned him up and I says you you better get yourself up here so now he came up he was standing at the door and he said oh I said and I took him in I showed him the body I says you fucking you, you gave him the heroin I know you gave him the heroin and look and he started like crying like well croc I, uh, so I slapped him a couple of times. I says, "Don't give us these fucking crocodile tears. You didn't even know him, so don't." Think. And I says, "You're going to give me some heroin for free, right? Now, you know, for the next few weeks, anyway." So I started like more like, and then I had the Irish people on the other side were saying to me, saying, "Tell us who gave him the heroin that killed. Give, give, give us the guy's name that gave him the heroin because we we're going to kneecap him." Or we're going to do something serious to him, and yet, and yet, at the same time, and then I, the police got involved. So the CID took me in for questioning eventually, because my flat, the guy who owned the flat, sort of bubbled me in really by saying, "Oh, actually, it was Mark Dempsey that found the body." It was that thing anyway. So the next thing, I'm stuck in this with the CID, no comment interview through the whole hang, and then I come out of there, and then the I, the, the Irish lads are like. Tells the name, tells the name of this guy, this guy, because we wanted to. Meanwhile, I'm want to get free heroin because I've got a, a sort of habit, and um, so it, it was just you know, and and I think back in the whole thing, I remember thinking this is because normally you'd be like, this is your best friend, this is your best friend, he's dead in front of you, but my thinking at the time because of the addiction was. This is a major inconvenience. This is what I thought at the time. I thought this is a major inconvenience. Like, and I remember feeling really angry that you'd taken it. I remember thinking, why did you, you know, like, why did you know just take some speed or why did you know just, you know, like, but um, so that was that. And um, and he was a good lad, he was a really good lad. And yeah, it's it's the the carnage from it, isn't it? So you said other friends of yours died. Any stories of, of what happened to them? A friend of mine got killed recently uh, in Scotland. He he got, his house got burnt down and uh, 
that was somebody from from my childhood like i knew really well that was a cocaine deal well that was a cocaine related the guy's got 33 years in prison who done it he sent he put petrol bomb he put petrol through the guy's door his two kids get killed oh. this is this is over this is over peanuts this is like oh. one thousand you're talking uh, 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 maybe I don't know a thousand pounds worth of debt, and the 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 guy, I spoke to uh, I spoke to people about it actually when it happened. I thought because because uh, the the his wife I went to school with as well, and um, you know it's just it's full of casualties really. When I look back, you know I've got friends that I, I wanted to try and get into recovery. I tried to help a friend. A, a, Another friend of mine died recently who was in a band uh, called Alabama 3 and uh, he died. There's just so many, throughout the years, there's so many, you know, that, you know, either get, uh, I had another friend, Dazza, who got killed in, in Amsterdam on some sort of drug deal, um, was taking to, like, a lot of money. He was taking some money across there. There was a... Um, you know, just throughout the years, if the, if it's not the drugs that kill them, it's the lifestyle. It's the it's like, you know, and and in places like Scotland, it's cheap. You know, people will people will kill you for like, I mean, you you can pay somebody a, a thousand pound or a couple of thousand pounds, and they'll go and they'll go and seriously hurt you, maybe even kill you. So it's and is this the part of the insanity of the war on drugs, drug laws that has created a lot of this problems? Well, it's a funny, right, okay, so that takes us on to a whole other topic, doesn't it? I mean, what do we do on the war of drugs? The war of drugs is just, if you think of rape, oh, God, right, we could go on, we could go off a tangent here, right? <laughs> uh, when they were trying to minimise the cocaine coming into the country, I remember Reagan's, Ray, when Reagan was in power and they were, like, they were they were providing all the chemicals to in Peru and Colombia, because I've been in Colombia and, and the Medellin, well, not in the Medellin, I was around Cartagena and away up Parque Tirona and Santa Marta, all around there, but, and I've been in Peru and Mexico as well, but I, I think the, uh, look, during that time, they, they, they were, pro America was providing all the chemicals, really, for the cartels to, to produce the cocaine, and when Reagan was when he was confronted about that, right? He says, "Oh, the reason we are continuing to provide the chemicals is because we are going to track. We want to track where the thing. There's just so much money that's made. That's and whatever you're making. Look, years ago, years ago here in London, when I was in jail in Spain, there was a guy who was there was a guy." who was providing most of the hash around the UK at the time, right? They call, uh, and uh, I'll not even say his name, but he, this guy, they called, his nickname was The Old Man, and and what happened is he was from an East London, he knew the travelling scene, so when Stonehenge was going on in 84, and 85, well, 84 was the last year, but up to that, throughout the early 80s, he would provide that, that whole festival scene with all the hash, so you had all the Hells Angels and all that, all getting the hash via, and it was all coming from him. And I know that what he went on the run to Spain, and he, he died, he actually never got killed, but I knew these guys who were getting arrested. So what, what was happening was people from all around the country would come and meet, go to his house, right, in London, and they would get, so say like me, you, and these guys here, we'd, we'd all, like, we're all in different parts of the country. One week you would go and get 100 kilo or whatever, and next week I'd go and get 100 kilo, and then, like, whatever. And But through, through the time, people kept getting arrested, right? And the common, the common theme was also they'd all been to his house, right? They'd all on their way back from his house. And what was happening was the police, he had a connection with the police where he would give, he had to, he would be given payments for sure, right? Given payments. And, but as part of that plan as well, part of the payment plan <laughs> was that he'd give whatever money, right? Say it'd be 50 grand a month or whatever it'd be, you know, whatever it might be. I don't know what, the, obviously, but he would also give a name. 
right, or give a registration of the car number plate that's going to be hit on the way back and the police would pull the car, you get nicked for the 50 kilo, you'd wind up in jail. So eventually we all wind up in jail, the four of us wind up in jail, and we are sitting down and we're going, it's not funny, you got nicked for 50 kilos, and then when you were coming out of his house, I saw the die, right, I got nicked for 70, 70 kilos. So eventually people got together and they said, right, he has to go. He's a super grass, really. And, um, you know, so they, you know, and, and so that exists, that that's just on a lower level, maybe in the UK, but that exists across. I mean, like you see it all the time. There's just so much money. Everything it comes into contact with, it corrupts. Oh, so you just look at that. This, if you, I don't know if you watched that. The dissident, really, about the Saudi, the uh, guy yeah. who got killed. Oh, watch yeah. that. It's quite good because you just think the Americans, Trump, and that's going. Oh no, but if they're providing all that. I mean, look, it's on a massive scale. If a bank, look, if you think it really, just in a, a thing, mate, if Credit Suisse get caught, right, they've just la they launder, I remember when they laundered, uh, there was something like a billion of Russian money, right, so it's, because I know some guys who are broke, like, who are private equity guys in Mayfair, who, they were telling me, when they're, they're to avoid Putin, Putin's trying to keep, so Putin's trying to keep all the money in Russia, and these guys are, like, trying to get the money out, left, right, and centre, right, and buying everything, football teams, whatever, so a lot of the private equity guys are making massive commissions on, obviously, all this money. But so a bank gets, so the Financial Conduct Authority get when, or, or they do some investigation, they see this bank's got a billion going through the accounts, right, laundered money. Who gets, nobody gets, nobody gets arrested. They get, they get a slap on the wrist for 200,000 maybe, and they've just laundered a billion, but they get 200,000, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Or 200 million. Or, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. and they just go like that. But that's, that's okay because it's, it's big, but it's corporate. Do you know what I mean? Whereas you launder, if I mean you launder a kind of chunk of money, we get caught outside this place today, we're going down 10 <laughs> years, man. <laughs> it's not going to touch us. Eh? So it's just corrupt. The idea is not to get too cynical about it all, isn't it? Because otherwise you just think, what do you do with you that? You lose your mind. In the end, you just like go through the pain barrier, don't you? And just oh. keep smiling. <laughs> 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 so, guns and more serious crime. Yeah, I guess I guess I just put that because, because there was a, I think for me, what I noticed, I remember this this uh, this experience that I had where I, I realised, you know, like I'd grown up in Glasgow, uh, where, where I get I got arrested when I was eighteen for intent supply and stuff and possession of cocaine when I was young, and the, a lot of the people that I was around when I was young, it, as a result of my family being involved in petty crime and some of the connections they had, it was quite normalised. Crime was quite normalised. So when I like, but the people that I was around in Glasgow were all sort of like back then it was all sort of hippies really that were doing a lot of the drugs, a lot of the cannabis especially. So they might be doing quantity, they might be doing 100 kilo or 50 kilo, but they weren't really, they weren't really, um, it wasn't, uh, it was organised crime to some degree, of course it was, but it wasn't like to the same level as what I experienced when I came to London. And, and, and I remember this one night uh, where I, I was actually going round to see if I met this guy round when I was working with these these guys, the Irish lads, and they had a flat. They had flats all over the place, but they had these like safe houses where it'd be like um, it was in a council block. It was basically like a flat in a council block. It was a council flat where they just put a bar. They just put basically like like a prison set. It'd just be like so as that you know if you came in you know, and whatever drugs they had, they would try and get rid of, well, I don't know what they're going to do with them, flush them down the toilet or whatever, but, the, but you couldn't really get, and uh, and it was more, I think, to protect, not necessarily the police, but to protect them from other gangsters or gangsters who would think. And I remember this one night, I went round to see this friend Dermot and he, and I got to this council block and around the same time, when I first met the Irish guys, I remember going into this house in Vauxhall, and I, and you're talking about the guy with the scar, like it, it, this, I remember like going into this, going into this house, and one of the chaps, 
uh, like he came to the door and he, he says uh, he do, wouldn't, they would never answer the door they'd never answer the front door they would uh, in case because the anti-terrorist squad were watching them right a big a big thing was the anti-terrorist squad I, I was questioned I was taken in by the anti-terrorist squad and fucking grilled man grilled massively and I had a story because the story was always the same like I went into that house I'm going to the middle floor flat. I'm getting a portrait done. The guy's an artist, which there was a guy who was an artist, but he was on the payroll. All the hash was in the middle floor. All the floorboards, under the floorboards was all the drugs in that middle floor flat. But he would never open the door. So you'd knock on the window. So that if it was getting, if there was surveillance, it'd go in. And I remember going in for the first time because I was arrested for this charge. And I was asking for advice from this guy. <laughs> this is how all happened because he was like, he was up for like some serious crimes. And 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 then I, I remember looking, and there was just like this room, and there was just these bags, Sainsbury's bags, and it was just full of money. I mean, it was just full like a money. And then there was a sawn-off shotgun, and there was like so. So I was aware that this is a different. This is a different league. It's a different, you know. And the people also were, they, uh, they were tough, they were hard, hard men, do you know what I mean? And um, so this, when I go to this flat, Dermot, I go to see Dermot, and I remember this experience, because he, he, just as I get there, he's going in the lift, and he's got a suitcase, and he, he says to me, eh, I'm just back from holiday, right? So I get in the lift with him, we go up to the second floor, da, da, da. we go into the thing, we open up the gate, the metal gate thing, the flat or the door and then the metal gate. And uh, Charlie, there's this guy Charlie there who liked Angel Dust, I'll never forget him as well because he loved taking Angel Dust and he was an, he was like one of these types of guy, a psychopath, right, Who who who's like, Hello there, how you doing, Mark? He's like, and I'd met him, I'd met him previously, and he sort of quite liked me. So he was very like, Oh, how you doing, Mark? Great to see you, great to see you. But he was like one of these really stocky, like, you know, like real gang, sort of gangster sort of face and, and like eyes of stone. And, and he, he had this sawn off shotgun, and he was like, Oh, let me show you, let me show you. Um, let me show you how we load this up and let me show you. So I'm like aware that I'm just trying to like keep them sweet, you know, like a piece, like trying to be like as if I'm really interested, but I'm actually really frightened because I've never really seen a song or shot apart from where I think. So, 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 so he's like, he's like uh, jumping around, like, well, he's just like, oh, let me show you, let me show you. And uh, and I'm like, yeah, Charlie, no problem. Let's let's see, <laughs> see what it looks like. I mean, I don't really, yeah. What else? There can't be that. There's no rocket science. I'm sure. I <laughs> just put the bullets in the shoot, and it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, look, look. And, and and he's out his head, right? So I'm fucking like, oh man, this guy's out his head. He's got a sonar shotgun, and then. And then Dermot takes me into the... So I go into the front room and then Dermot opens up the suitcase. It's a long zip round the seat and he opens it up. I'll never forget it. It's just this like flappy thing. It opens up this suitcase and it's full, full of... And at the top of it, so it's like half the size of this It's like, it's just all LSD, just all thousands and thousands of LSD, like blotting papers. So there's like just sheets. So there, I, I don't know how many. Maybe it was about hundred thousand trips, you know. But on, underneath all it was all grass, all from Kenya or wherever it was from at the time. So it was packed, right? Then, so I'm sitting there now. The reason I went to see Dermot initially was I was going to take some trips because Dermot had said to me, he says, "Come round one night. We'll take a couple of acid." Right, and we'll fucking have a hoot, man. Like, we'll just, like, trip out. We'll listen to Pink Floyd or something. Or, right, and I was like, yeah, yeah, so it seems like a good idea. So I'd initially came round with the idea, I'm going to take some LSD, I'm going to listen to some Pink Floyd and just fucking, you know, smoke some joints. But when I get there and I see Charlie with his shotgun and I'm fucking... <laughs> 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 right, his head on the fucking angel dust, and I'm like, 
<laughs> thinking, mm. I'm thinking this is not the fucking right set. <laughs> <laughs> this is not peace and love it's like the fucking opposite it's like the antichrist I've got the door and I've got I've got I've got this fucking thing and then if that's not bad enough then what happens what happens is the door goes and then there's these three these three sort of likely like, like cockneys like Bow in like it's like something that uh it's like my friends uh, does my friend Nick Love does all the the football factory. I'm quite good friends with Tamir and the, you know the guy and Danny Dyer as well. Like the guys that do all the my friend does all them football factory movies and he's a director. He does great movies and I so I'm in them. Um, so these three lads come fucking bowling in right. So so one of them's like you know. Of wide, you know, he's got the, he's got the swagger. He's got the whole like, oi, oi, what's going on? What is, you know, like <laughs> fucking, what's happening? We got everything, everything under control, everything under control. <laughs> and I'm fucking looking. I'm thinking. And so there's a set of nun right because Dermot likes he used to do like he does martial arts nun trickers. He's got a pair of nun trickers that are on the couch. Right? So this guy comes in. And there's two other ones that are not really doing it. Charlie's at the door, fucking like out his head on angel dust, fucking like the shotgun, like, like, like just waiting for something to happen. Uh, the guy picks up the nunchuckers, and actually he was fucking really good at them. He, he started, to, he started to, he picked them up, and he was just like, and he was like, fling, he was, he was sort of flinging them around his body. <laughs> Dermot's there with a the suitcase with all the drugs, right? And and the tension in this room, I will never fucking forget it. It was like you could cut it with a fucking like at any second, and I could see Charlie. So I'm looking, you know, Charlie's on one side with a shotgun, ready to take aim, right? Because he thinks the Cockney lads going to hit Dermot with the nunchuckers, and the two others are going to like just take the bags of suitcase of drugs. I'm sitting here thinking there is fucking no way I'm taking acid in this situation. <laughs> this is the fucking, you know. And I think it was that, that mm. I remember that experience and I was thinking this is like a level, this is a serious level up from the sort of hippie types in Glasgow or the, you know, the, the sort of peace and love type. You, you know, it's really, you're in a different, you're in a different league. And, and, of course, I hung around with that, them people for quite a while, for four or five years. And so there was lots of those types of, I mean, there was lots of things where people were, I mean, like, it was so irrational, Sean. It was so, they would just be, because they're all coked. Because this is the thing is, cocaine was always looked upon as if that was okay. Coke, we all take coke, heroin, scummy, shit drug. So within that within that group, it was like coke's like sort of not. So they would all be using coke, right? So the so the problem with that is right is that if there was any fucking psychopathic tendencies already, you just had you just had the fucking coke into the equation, and they're doubly even and and then they're just like completely going off key. So I had these. Um, you know, I, I I'd have these experiences where I'd be sitting there and there'd be um I'd get invited round to because you felt as if you were part of the what would happen is you, you felt as if you were getting taken into the fold, like, oh we really like you, Mark, you're Scottish. Because because also I was Catholic, right? So because I'm a Celtic supporter and Catholic, the whole INLA, IRA thing, you're one of us. You fucking you you you're not a loyalist. So therefore, you pro irate, right? So, so that's what was going on way back in. So I was sort of taken into the fold, right? So then what happens is I'd be sitting there, and and there'd be some sort of party, and then something would be happening upstairs, and I'd say, well, what's happening up? You know, what's going on upstairs? And somebody would be getting like hung out a window, or you know, there'd be something. This guy's done something to his girlfriend, or we heard he's done this. He needs to be taught a lesson, 
we're going to think. So there was always this sense of anxiety, <laughs> like fear that at any point it could be you, right? <laughs> that you could have done something. And if you're sniffing the coke as well, you're doubly paranoid, you know? So I remember sitting there one day and, and uh, they gave, and I didn't know what had happened and one of them had gave, one of them had spiked somebody, had spiked somebody with some acid and the guy ran in and says, you fucking spiked me with acid, right? And, 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 and he was met by everyone. And this guy ran in, just went bang, 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 like rapid, like five or six blows. Like it was, it was like something like a John Wayne movie or something. It just like went, come on, and went, you just spiked. It, it was his girlfriend. He says, you just spiked my fucking girlfriend with acid, right? I knew nothing about it. I, and next thing he just went smash, 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 smash. <laughs> And, then, and the guy was like all blood, like bleeding. And I said to the guy, I says, did you spite his girl? He says, no, I don't know anything about it. So I never knew, <laughs> I never knew <laughs> what was really, who to trust. Because everybody was lying to one another. So that was, that's that really. What's the most paranoid you've ever been in your life? Um, oh man, let me think. Uh, God, I've had some acid, uh, I've had some bad acid trip. I've been, I've been with coke, I think, paranoia with coke. And um, yeah, we, yeah, I think with coke times, I think, I think, right, I think those times where, where I was in those situations where I really didn't know where I stood. Like that one night when all that happened, when he st started smashing the guy up, right? Right, what had happened previous to that, and this is what fucking this is this is what what used to go on, right? So this guy here, so the main guy was up for a big charge, right? So he couldn't do the business, so he handed all the business down to his like soldier, really. This guy, this other guy, said, "You're going to now directly while I'm out the picture for the next year until his court case is over, you're going to deal directly with him, right?" So I'm dealing directly with this guy. Mean, meanwhile, often he would say things like, and this was the thing I could never work out, was he'd say things about the other guy, right, behind his back. And I, I, and, and I would never say it. So it, I, I thought that what he was doing a lot of times was trying to get me to then say something <laughs> about to agree. <laughs> To agree or something. So say, say, you know, he's fucking lazy or something. It might be, it might be something like quite small to begin with, but it could go, <laughs> sure, you know, that's type of stuff. Then. It could be something just like quite insignificant, seemingly quite insignificant, but could be a fucking major problem. Because the thing is, if you say anything, if you were perceived to uh, conflict, anyway, it would put me into a thing. So I remember that night in particular, after that happened, I remember being really, really paranoid because I was coked out my head and this had just happened. This guy was getting punched all around the street. I thought he's, <laughs> I thought, and there was 11 brothers, there was 10 brothers. So it was like, there was like a big family, you know what I mean? And I thought, my God, this is just going to get, you know, and of course I knew also about people getting hung out the windows <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> So you're just like living on edge, really, like, you know, and then you're dealing with the stress of it all by just drinking more or, you know, you know, but then you're, it's only after you're out of it all, you're just thinking, God, man, that was like, I mean, it's insane. Do you have any stories of police par paranoia? I, I get, um, I get, I used to get police paranoia a lot, like, I, I mean, like, really... I mean, look, I used to put the drugs, I mean, the drugs, I used to, in, when I stayed in Brixton, I would be continually thinking that I'm going to get busted, right? I, all, all the time, really, I'd be thinking. So what I used to do was, at night time, I'd put all the drugs, I'd just get the bag of drugs, and I'd put them in my neighbour's garden. Because <laughs> I thought, I thought, they're not going to go and look in my neighbour. So my neighbour... Like had a house and there was no the fence had been sort of like broke so I used to just and they, they had an outside toilet but it was an old derelict outside toilet 
So I used to just climb over and I used to just put it in there. No one, you couldn't really see from their back window. You couldn't see where the thing. So that's what, so I, I, I was paranoid. Yeah, always like about, I was going to get busted. Uh, I was always, part, like I used to get taxis around a lot too. Um, I was, uh, oh fuck it. Uh, the anti, when the anti-terrorists, when I got caught with the anti-terrorist squad, squad that night, uh, I just came out, it was such a mad thing because I came out of the house, out of his house and uh, the main, and anyway, I was, I came round the corner and there was, uh, and then there was all these guys running up, it, it, like we were, we get into a car and then all these guys sort of just got us and then they took us to the, the station and then they were like asking loads and loads of questions and it was like, um, so there's been so many different times like that. I mean, it's just like, I think it's just all the time, really, you're paranoid, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, I was doing crystal meth and stuff, that oh. staying up for days, I had a lot of paranoia back then. Oh, I bet you. Yeah. Oh, I bet you, with yeah. crystal meth. That, so all that was later, I never got, yeah, because crystal meth wasn't really around. When, right. So what year, what year did you? This is like um, mid to late 90s. Aye, in, aye. In, our, in America. Aye, in America. Aye, yeah. of course. Aye. It was so never really it. caught on here, did it? Like you did no, like that. I then, I, yeah. I. So you would have just been like completely like just wired and just because of the, because of the psychosis, because of the thing and the sleep deprivation and mm. the, the auditory hallucination, you would be getting auditory, yeah. visual hallucinations. I mean, I got that with Coke to some degree when... <clears throat> Uh, when I was smoking crack and mm. like just like uh, just some mad just mad thinking just mad insane yeah. thinking and then what he acts like you know really believing that other people in the house are all conspiring against me I'm going to like I'm getting a big knife and like thinking uh, you know what they're going to, they're going to attack me or you know like crazy thoughts mm. like that yeah People really start to act up with prolonged paranoia, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, but there's some funny, oh, funny, funny. It makes you a bit funny ways, funny stories around it. Aye. So you got a story here then. Lost money, street addict. I so then I, then I wound up. I and this is the near the end because this is what's important really is to talk about. Also, so I got so I started using. So really, like sort of maybe like 1980, 1979, 1980, when I first started using, I got clean in 96, so it was like, so the end of 96. So actually, Gilf, the last time I was here, I went to a concert with Eric uh, Clapton, he took me, to, he took me, he stays, he's just near here, and then he uh, took me to see a, an old band called Hot Wind. When I got clean, I met, uh, how I wound up writing the book, how before that, I met Eric when I was really like only a couple of weeks clean and uh, he he was like really supportive and and kind and uh, well I was I mean it was my situation because he was doing this I go to 12 step meetings so I went to this 12 step event but it was like a music night and my friend who used to play in a band called Monkfish uh, who played with Jimi Hendrix actually in Isla White this band, so he was having this thing, there was only like 70 people, 80 people, in this shitty little venue in Brixton, in this like crypt, and there I'm sitting there, and there's like about 70 addicts, and my friend, who's dead now, said that's Eric who's just walked in, right I said, what the fuck's Eric, because I had no idea, like the, the amount of uh, I mean, there's so many people, so many uh, celebrities, you know, got clay, like so that, and they've really and they've created their own rehabs and they've turned their life around and they're real good spokesperson for reco good spoke people for recovery and very out there about it as well. And and Russell who signed it because Russell's a good pal as well when he's signed the books and all. Well, he's done the forewords and stuff. But um, so so I, I so my friend said that's Eric, uh, and I said. I said, what the fuck what would, what would Eric Clapton be doing here in this shitty church hall in uh, December, 90, you know, it's like a wet winter's night in, you know, in Brixton. And he says, because he's in the programme, he's like, he does loads of stuff, he helps, 
he does he does events and he helps people. Um, and so so he, he said uh, he said to me and Eric just came in. He just done this. He basically just stood at the side where the band were playing. Didn't he take up any of the limelight? Just like basically, uh, really humble. Just like play, but he knew it was fucking Eric. I mean, amazing. I mean, um, guitarist. So, so, so then my friend was like, "Can you ask him for? Uh, can you get his autograph for me?" And in the whole twelve step thing, you're not meant to get uh, any autograph. You know, because it's like it's a twelve step program, right? You know, it's like it's meant to be anonymous. So, so anyway, so. <laughs> so anyway, I went up there after it and he, and he says, yeah, no problem. He says, get, get me a bit of paper and I'll give you the thing, mate. And then that was, um, yeah, that like, it was just, it was just amazing because that night I'd met him, I'd been chatting to him for a bit and, and then, uh, you, you then, then from there, I, when I was a kid, I had two posters on the wall of two musicians. One was Jimmy Page for Zeppelin, who I'm pals with as well, and he, uh, who came to my book launch, uh, another was Eric. And and that night when I met Eric, I thought, fucking hell, this is like, so you could get clean, change, you know, like, like life, because I always had this thing where if you took away drugs, alcohol, life would just be so boring, it'd be so monotonous, but no fun anymore. But there, there I was, and I had this amazing night, and I'd met one of my sort of heroes from childhood, and he was really kind and compassionate, not at all aloof or arrogant, you know, and and it was sort of the beginning. So I'd lost, what had happened is, I'd lost all the money. All the money that I made, I spent really through, I had like a few years where I just was used, I was in India and I was using coke, and in those times, even when I was up in the Golden Triangle, I was just spending money all the time and all the money that I got, it just all dwindled. And it's funny because I, I remember at one point and it, cause I've got this, this uh, in the flat, I've, oh, I rent that flat, but I've got other properties, but I, that I own, but I, uh, I remember I was going out with a girl who's dead now as well. And her dad bought a flat in the center of London. I remember at the time I thinking I could buy a couple of them flats, you know, which are now worth mm. millions, millions, you know. And anyway, so so I lost all the money. So my ego was really deflated. So I felt near the end of my using, I'd hit a place which I needed to hit where I hit a rock bottom. And, and a rock bottom in a way where emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically, definitely, I was just... Uh, the lights were out, you know, it was like a cooker, like a cooker with the four rings, all of those rings were defunct, man, right? And and there was no way out, but either, either I was going to kill myself or I was going to wind up dead or I got recovery, right? And and what happened to me, I had this experience in a, and it's quite a mad thing, but in a toilet, in a, in a toilet in St. Thomas's Hospital, uh, Another friend who's dead now as well, who, who, who died of the virus, HIV, HIV, and it went on to fully blown. But I, I had this experience in this toilet where I got this moment of like, and I, I sort of prayed, and it was mad really because I don't really then, I don't even now. I, I'm really into quantum physics, and I, 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 I like string, I like all this sort of scientific stuff. Not really, but. But then I, I did sort of, I did really pray for something to help me because my I felt like think like uh, at my lowest ebb, suicide, a lot of suicidal ideation, and then I wound up getting nicked. I wound up in Belmarsh, and a lot of things happened, all fitted into place. I got the charge that I was up for in the inner city of London. So the last court that I was in was in the, the only court I was in, Crown Court was in a city of London Crown Court. And I wound up clean, 10 years clean, being on jury service in that same court, leading the jury to convict me. <laughs> it's like, you, you couldn't make it up. One minute I was actually the accused. Next minute, it's like poacher, gamekeeper stuff, isn't it, really? One minute I'm in that court accused. Next minute, I'm the head of the jury. <laughs> 
head of the fucking jury. I'm telling them, I'm t- and I'm, it's not even just that. I'm influencing the whole of the jury. It's not like, because I'm not, because I'm a convict. Because I know everything, the jury are all clueless. They're all like, oh, well, well how come... They can't be, they can't be, they've got to be innocent because there's no forensic. I says, but they're fucking three days to clean all their clothes. Of course there was no forensics. And then I say, and they had three days to make the story all together. They just sat in the room for three days and says, look, this is the story. We all are saying the same story. And but the jury were like, oh, but they're all saying the same story. That means it must be true. I said, yeah, but, <laughs> but surely you must put your head together. Yeah. So, so not just that, not just that I was like, it's not just that I was on jury service, I was actually really pro getting the right conviction. <laughs> all the way. Because I was sitting and I thought, the guys who had done this crime, they were really, they beat the shit out of this person really badly. And I thought, you, you deserve, you deserve everything you get for that. I think the cameras went. I did it. Yeah, it's all right. Keep going. Is it? <laughs> Keep going. Aye, aye. And so, um, so yeah, it's, it's a funny, uh, so... <clears throat> So I guess like losing all the money, and then I, I, uh, and so there was no way, and then I had this one, and then I wound up uh, in this rehab. I wound up getting into this rehab. Went for the wrong reasons. Went to avoid the prison sentence. But actually, when I got there, and they started to talk about, uh, you know, and meeting probably Eric and doing some stuff like meeting people in the program and twelve step program. I started to realise, God, I'm an addict, man. This is like, this is the main thing that I, it doesn't really matter what it is, if it's drugs, alcohol, gambling, it can be anything. I I just have got an insatiable appetite for everything. I, I never have enough. I always want more, right? And even when I get more, I, I want, so even if I get the model looking girlfriend, there's also another girlfriend over there who looks even nicer. There's a thing, or, or there's this part of me that's, it's unquenchable. It's like, it just can't. So that's what I need to work on. So what's at the root of that? Why is that going on? And then, okay, so how do you find a, a way to live your life where you're not enslaved by, because addiction comes from the addic- addictus to, and it was initially Latin for to be enslaved, to be to be bound by, to be enslaved. So a lot of the stuff that I was doing, when I was doing, when I was smuggling fucking heroin back to England or heroin back to Amsterdam or loads of hash back to Amsterdam, not so much for the hash, but later on I started to think I really didn't want to be doing it, right? I mean, I remember like going on these planes and doing it all, like getting it all prepared and a part of me, my spirit was like, uh, I don't want to be doing this. This is fucking insane and this could kill me. But, I was bound back, like I couldn't not do it. I was completely like powerless over like the, the whole thing that like, I had to, because I had to get, because I was physically dependent as well. And I was like, I need to get the money and I need to get, so I couldn't see any way really out of it. And and so, so I guess when I got into this rehab and stuff and I started to see, oh, you can live your life in a very different way and you can channel, you Look, and it's back to the transferable skills is like if you channel your energy in a productive way right in a legal way you could do just as well man if not much in fact i have legally i've got much more now than i did then but and i've done it all legally do you know what i mean so if you if you're if you're that way inclined if you're if you're ambitious if you're driven you can channel that in the right way so that's what's been a great thing. I mean, even this now, I'm doing this way street cat named what was saying to you about James Bowen and uh, Paul Ferris. I'm going to we're going to do this. We're going to do this uh, documentary drama. Um, Jack Pepper Productions are going to help us with that. Uh, you know, which is which is really good. I'm going to uh, I'm doing I'm going to do some podcast stuff with Paul and my other friend Tosca Jackson, who used who was in Kiss FM. So we're going to do so. There's lots of stuff, um, you know, that you that I can do, and so it, and you, you know, um, and the work that I do with people with addictions by helping people, I feel that all of that dark stuff, all of the stuff that I've experienced, like most people would come and see me, they come and see me 
not for all, I've got loads of qualifications and therapists, traumatologists, family systemic psychotherapy. They don't come to see me because of my qualification. They come because of my personal experience. They come because they know I've been in those dark, dark places and I've managed to get out and to find the way out, you know. So it, 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 you can turn it all to, you know, it's like it's, you can transfer it into something really positive. And you've got a really great energy about you as well. That I'm sure yeah. they come for you. Um, robbed and strangled, left for dead in Peru. Peru. I right. What have we got? We've got. This is, we got the last one. This yeah. might be the last one. Yeah. I, okay. Right. So, <laughs> what what one to finish on? I okay. So I'll tell you what happened to us uh, on this last one. Right. Uh, so I'm now five year clean, six year clean. I'm in Peru. I'm in a place called Cusco, which is the start of the Machu Picchu, where you're doing them. Inca, like you go up in the train up to Machu Picchu and do the Inca trails. Uh, um, no, I might well go and see Machu Picchu. So I'm out clubbing this night. Uh, I'm a bit like, I'm doing loads of kickboxing. I'm five years clean. So I get a bit like, I'm clean, but I'm also always been quite mad anyway, right? So, but so I get into things, I get into kickboxing and then I'm doing like kickboxing classes galore. I think I'm like Jackie Chan, really. And then, <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> but I'm fucking, I'm not, obviously. And and anyway, so I'm in, uh, I go to this club and it's two o'clock in the morning. I come out of this club in uh, Cusco. I've always stayed, uh, there's some attraction, there's always been attraction to dangerous places. I've always went, Historically, I think it's been brought up in Glasgow and been there in the Gorbals and been in gangs and all that. There's a, always this part of me feels that I'm not alive unless there's a potential that I could be killed or something. Or that, that I don't feel quite that it's only, I even when I do the paragliding or something like that, I, I do paragliding and, and, and uh, I was learning to fly planes, just a, a biplane just recently before all this COVID thing happened. But I, so, so. I chose this hotel, it was in a do quite a dodgy part. People would say to me when I was in Peru, even when I first got there, I remember in Lima, this guy saying, <clears throat> I was just booked into the hotel and this guy said, I said to him, oh, what was your trip like in Peru? And he says, oh, it was great. He says, but be careful of the taxis. That's what he says, be careful of the taxis. And that's all he said. And then he walked away and I thought, that's for the ages. It's okay. It must, right, it must be dodgy taxi. Anyway, so this night I come out of this club. I'm walking up, like, back to where my hotel was. It's two o'clock in the morning. I'd been in the club desperately trying to chat up girls. I chatted, I'd wound up being, I'd been reasonably okay, successful in other attempts when I'd been in Peru. Peru. But, and, but this night I was like, Oh, I just thought this is crazy. The music's really loud. You can't speak to him. <laughs> My Spanish is so limited. It's not going to happen, right? So I, so I come out. I'm walking up. I'm walking up the road, and almost like the hairs in the back of my, I can feel danger. It's tangible. It's like you know, because as animals, we can feel, we can sense that there's a threat imminent, really, right? And I can sense, and these three guys come out of a sort of alleyway in front of me. So in my head, and my ego, right, is saying, this is the story, right? It goes, I don't worry about them, Mark, because, you know, you've been doing two... <laughs> <laughs> you've been doing kick two kickboxing classes a day for the last fucking, like, year and a half. You're sparring all the time. The Peruvians are quite small. Look, look at... <laughs> <laughs> this is the, this is exactly what it was saying. The proving is quite small. I reckon. I right. This is just, it says. I reckon you can at least smash two of them quite quickly before, and the third one you'll just finish him off. You'll just like so you'll do the two of them, and then you'll finish the thing, right? So this is going on in my head, and then so I'm sort of smiling almost, like walking off. <laughs> <laughs> and they they're looking at me as I'm getting a bit nearer. They're like smiling, 
And then another part of me thought, actually, is this right? Is this the information your head is telling you? Fucking <laughs> correct, really. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe maybe you're really fucking misjudging this. So, <laughs> but by that time, I'm quite near them, right? So I'm like, but there's a street that goes along, like, there's a street. So they're like about 50 yards away, or maybe 75 yards away. But really, what I should have done, what a sensible person would do, is they'd go, fucking hell, this is a dark street, there's two o'clock in the morning, all the shutters are closed, there's no one around, there's not one <laughs> person, there's no place, there's nothing, and there's three guys just come out an alleyway. This is like not looking good, man, right? This is no matter how much fucking kickboxing you do for the rest of your life, you're going to get the shit beaten out of you, right? So, <laughs> so, so then I, so then what, what happens is I think, Okay, there's a street along it, right? So I see us. I think, all right, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a light jog. I'm going to start just like, and I'm going to look back, keep my eye, case they're starting to jog as well. So that's just, so I start to do a wee jog. Uh, I look around, they've got, I can't see them, right? So I'm like, all right, sound. And then this car pulls up, right? So as taxi, like taxi, I'm thinking, oh, taxi, that's quite handy. Actually, this could work quite well. I'll get the taxi, I'll go. And they'll drop me up the thing. But so, so I get in the taxi, but the taxis in Peru is as if they've not got the number on the side, they get these the moody taxi plates. This is what I later found out. They get these moody taxi plate and they just put it there on, on the window and it looks like a taxi. So I was the words of the guy from earlier not oh, in no, your head. No, no, it never came. The words After, of the taxis. I, when it was in the taxi and it was all coming, I thought, that oh, fucking guy, yeah, it was then, but it was a bit late for that. So what happened is I get in the cab, the guy goes, would, would you want to go or whatever he says? And I say, oh, sh uh, that's a tail name. So we start driving and then he just stops, right, the fucking car. He just stops the car. And at this bit, there's an alleyway that's coming out and these three guys, I see the three guys run, running out the fucking alley alleyway, really, coming towards the car. It's really like, it's like in slow motion. So I thought, oh, fuck. Right, and I just realised it's completely on top. So the guy who's going to get in your side where you are, Sean, that so my door's here. So what I do is I think I fucking I've got to get I've got to get past you. Or I've got to get past you. So I swivel round on the seat. So when he's trying to get in, I try and kick him in the head. Uh, but he move. But he's got this kitchen. He's got a big kitchen knife, and he just gets the kitchen knife. And he just puts it round. So meanwhile, there's one getting on this side and there's one getting on the other side. And then, uh, <clears throat> so I, I'm basically, so I try and kick him in the head. He gets a knife round the back of my neck. The other one's got in now. He's trying to grab my hand, my arms. I'm sort of flailing around in the back and he's got, he's got the knife at my neck. And I'm just like, and I've got 400 pounds. Mm -hmm. And twenty pound notes, all in my money belt, because I'm too pa Thank God I never had a credit card or debit card. Because if you've got credit cards, debit cards, what they usually do, what they can do, or they can just kill you. Because five hundred pound, if you get five hundred, what they do is they take get your personal. They say, give us your personal number, and if you don't give them the personal, they'll just stab you or just hurt you, torture you until you get the number, and then you give them the number, and then they'll plot you up. They might plot you up in a little shack somewhere in the ghetto. And fucking feed your steak and kidney pie every couple of days if you're lucky, and and they'll just milk the account. But they might not. They might just think five hundred pound a day, five five hundred pound to a Peru. Like bearing in mind the normal work, the salary scale of a Peruvian is like one hundred and fifty dollars a month. So five hundred pounds is like fifty grand to us. Like it's, it's like it's a chunk of money, and if you're taking that money out, so. Anyway, so I'm in the back of the car and and uh, I'm thinking, and, it, and I had this mad like moment where I think all my life's experience with psychos and, and people, <laughs> it all sort of helps in that moment because there's a part of me absolutely knows how to sort of navigate it really. Now they're out their head on bazooka because they're smoking the paste. They're all fucking wired. Well, they're wired from two different reasons. They're wired because they're robbing a tourist, but and if they get caught, they're going to get a long prison sentence, could get bashed up, could even get shot maybe by the Peruvian police. 
and they are also smoking paste so because it's really cheap and that's what they all do and they're like and so they're all sort of wired i'm like in the back of the car and i'm thinking and this is what's going on in my head is i only want to give them 20 pounds right i i've got 400 pounds in my fucking money belt right and my head is saying okay you just need to get 20 pounds 40 at the most out your pocket out your out thing so i'm trying to get the money i'm trying to take two 20s out my thing to get down so as you say almost like i'll take this guys and let's call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> and let's just forget it all happened and i'll just go my way but that's not going to happen obviously and then so they're like and and they drive me they were driving along the window slightly opened a wee bit. At one point, we're, we're going at the past and there was a shop or something. There was some type of thing and I remember shouting, Robo! I shouted, Robo! Right, uh, really, and they just shut the window and the guy pushed the knife a wee bit closer into the juggler. And then I, I remember feeling, okay, I've just got to, I've just, I've just, it'll be okay. Everything will be okay. You know how to deal, you, you know, just don't, just don't do anything more to aggravate them it'll be okay so then they take me away outside the town we're away now in this fucking ghetto where there's there's basically uh you're in the there's just shacks little wooden shacks and a burnt out car and a like wild some barking dogs and thing it's just like bleak really and um and they they're i'm in this car with them and they've got lots of time there's no one around there's no police so they they take everything they take the, the belt from my waist the shoes the passport the camera everything that i've got i've got one of them little cameras at the time because it was way back then and and then they're saying things like to me the, this guy because i speak a wee bit of spanish and he's saying to me we could do anything really we want to it was putting it putting a knife in my ear and then round my groin saying literally we could do anything to you and I'm trying to say in Spanish, right, broken Spanish, I know your predicament, guys, right? I'm trying to say to them almost like, I've been in the same situation. I know what it's like to have addictions. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to get them to empathise in some way with me. I'm sort of trying to counsel them in the back of this fucking car. Right? I mean, it's lunacy, really. And they... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to like talk to them in this manner to get this response because I'm wanting them to like me then. <laughs> and say, I want like all these other cycles in the past, like oh, if they like me, they'll just let me go. They might even give me half of the money back. <laughs> <laughs> might even drive me back to the hotel for a <laughs> so this is the type of stuff that's going on in my head when it's going. and also so then they take me out the car and uh, and I, I'm, I'm out the car now and then they've got us and I think they're just going to so the guy's sort of getting me onto the floor and he's got me in this sort of jiu-jitsu sort of lock he's got and then I'm aware that I'm running, he's actually putting pressure on and I'm running out oxygen. So I'm thinking, fucking hell, that he's actually trying to kill me. These guys are going to kill me. And so then I'm really fighting, I'm trying my best. But look, this is the thing about the Jackie Chan thing, right? Is that there is no way, <laughs> no matter no matter how many kickboxing, like, there's no way, there's four, there's three guys and the other, the driver who was trying to kid on it, he was just, that just happened. The driver, when it all started happening, he was saying, Capasa, what's as if it was like he wasn't part of the whole thing. But of course, so he was there as well. And and then just before I was running out of oxygen, my head said to me, it says, look, and I got this. It was like, uh, I mean, I don't know if it was like it's something existential or whether it was just like a sort of survival mechanism that really kicked in. It said, but certainly when just kid on, just stop. Mark, just stop fighting and just kid on that you're dead almost. Just slump down, let your body relax and just let let go, really. And that's what I done. That was the last thing that I remember doing. I just went like slumped. And then uh, I fucking uh, and then the, and then the next thing I woke up uh, and they were gone. 
and I woke up and there was beside the road, beside just on this thing, the burnt out car was across here and there was like some shacks there. And I was a lot, I was like, and I remember thinking, God, I am so glad to be alive. I am so glad to be alive. I, uh, and I, I'd real sore throat. And, and then I, I remember like, cause I had no shoes and I went up, there was a light on in one of the shacks. I went up to the shack, knocked on the shack. They turned the light off. They were probably frightened. They'd probably, um, and, uh, and then I had to uh, try and find my way. Oh man. And then it got even a bit fucking worse because then, or two, two mats, is it? No, I, then what happened, um, what happened is there was all these wild dogs, right? And <laughs> So one of these these dogs started coming up and such stuff, and I was like trying to like walk to the thing. So I picked up a rock and threw it at this dog, and then they all started like barking, man. And then I was like, the next thing, I fucking they were all like a whole group of dogs, about ten dogs. I mean, we it, right. So I had to climb on top of this burnt out car because the fucking dogs. Because I was thinking, I'm going to get rabies, man. They're going to fucking bite. You know, we say, look. There's a saying in the fellowship that says, "The worst day, the, 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 what is it? The the, the the worst day in recovery is better than your best day using." Right now, it's such a fucking lie. I I've had some fucking amazing days using, and I've had some terrible days clean. This was one of the most, <laughs> but there is a general there is a gist to it. It means that you know we're free from addiction and all the rest of it. But I remember like I was on top of this car and I was thinking. It doesn't get much worse than this, man. Like, I've just been robbed. And then, but I'm alive, but there's these dogs. And then how am I going to get, you know? And then uh, I managed to, uh, I managed to eventually, uh, the dogs disappeared. And then I, I like came down off the car and then slowly. And then I met these two, I uh, found this little track. The moon was out, so I, I, and I could see the town from away because it was up in the hill. I could see Cusco from miles away. And then I found a dirt track, started walking down the dirt track. And then I met these two guys who, had wheelbarrows who were coming back from the town and they sell, because they use coca uh, for the altitude sickness, coca tea and stuff in, in, in those areas. So uh, they offered me some coca. I says, no, no, I'm clean, I'm limpy. I, da, da, da. I was like six year clean at the time or whatever it was. I mean, that was the thing. When there was I was going to get, when I thought I was dying, my head was doing this number, was saying, my God, this is not meant to happen. You're not meant to die like this. It's six year clean. You're not, it's, of all the things that you've went through, it's not meant to happen like this. You're not like so, but they uh, uh, and then eventually I got to the t uh, eventually I got to this road and then uh, and then I uh, I wound up uh, eventually getting to a bigger road and then there was some shops. Got a taxi. Taxi took me at the police station. He it was a really sweet. Some of the, the this taxi driver and then the police were quite cool as well. And then I'd done a report, but then I was like in. So through the whole thing, I was fucking, I was quite calm, right? I was I was quite calm. But when I got back to my hotel, I was like checking in the toilet, you know, I was properly like traumatized from it. And then for the rest of the holiday, I, I bought a big lock knife. I was just walking around. <laughs> I was just walking around. <laughs> then MD comes near me and he's just stabbed them, you know. <laughs> because I was just like I just was sure, you know, like I was going to get fucking, you know, in the taxi, I wound up having to get into taxis again. I was just sitting on the back of the taxi. The no <laughs> but I was determined at the same time, I'm not going to let this spoil my trip. You know, I'm, I'm not going to go back to England. I'm not going to let these bastards spoil my trip. Anyway, I think that's, uh, that's that one. Wow. What a masterclass in storytelling this mm. has been today. I mean, some people come on, we ask them a question and they give like a 10 second answer. Do you want to come on the bloody podcast? Take some lessons from Mark <laughs> Dempster. <laughs> Not just engaging and exciting, but so bloody funny as well, man. Uh, um, We've had some wrecking tears on here, but mm. you were way up there. That mm. was absolutely brilliant. Can't thank you enough. Oh, my, 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 my insides are. I know, it's <laughs> great. I'm really pleased. Like that. I, Okay. I, I, I know, it's great. It's been a while since I left I, I, for two hours I, straight. I, yeah, no, it's great, man. How can people support you, Mark? Uh, oh, right, okay. So, guys, look, that, that book's on Amazon. That's our well, first book. And then the ongoing path, this one, there's on uh, on Amazon as well. And uh, listen, if you want, if people need um, therapy, or I've got, a, I've got a therapy business, you just put my name in, uh, 
Google and you'll see my practice in Harley Street. So that's it. Buy my books and uh, that's it, guys, really. All of Mark's links will be in the description box below this video. If you have enjoyed this interview today, please let us know in the comments. Huge thank you to Joe and James Thanks, for coming Joe and James. along and, and filming today. And um, like I said, yeah, um, thank you to the new subscribers. Subscription logos in the bottom corner. And all our links and uh, Mark's links are in the description box. So we appreciate you going down and checking our shit out. Brilliant, man. Give us okay. a hug. Yeah, 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 yeah fantastic. Wow. Brilliant. <laughs> Excellent. Did you really enjoy it, Sean? Fucking yeah. hell. Yeah.